I've entitled my presentation A Countdown of 10 Educational Topics of Manure Gas Safety. I'm Rob Minen from Penn State's Department of Animal Science. When I uh, look at my topic, I wanted to span the title a little bit. And this audience is largely extension people, agency folks, it's, uh, industry support. So I want to provide talking points for you. Some of you have actually seen some of my slides or heard me talk about this in the past. So I want to provide science-based uh, information to my audiences, but bring that back to operational reality, practical lessons that we can discuss risk and proper awareness and avoidance. So I'm looking at the important factors, common themes, and uh, some other information that I've learned. I've talked about this quite a bit to a number of people. So my top 10 list starts with this. Uh, manure incidences often go unreported. Loss of consciousness uh, occurs without a report. I know six people that have gone through uh, an unconscious phase at some point at a manure storage, four of them with liquid systems, and two of them at solid manure uh, situations in the poultry industry. All of those, of course, are not statistically accounted for anywhere. Also, a number of reports that I'll hear of, of heifers and dairy cows and finishing hogs that die. And, of course, these things go unreported. So we need to think about this is maybe a bigger uh, issue than we sometimes appreciate. I look at two studies that, that I draw from frequently, Field and Beaver from 2007 here in the U.S. and Park et al. from 2016 was the uh, study done in Korea, but has a lot of very important information that we can glean from. Repair and maintenance and rescue are certainly high-risk activities. When we look at the second column, repair and maintenance resulted in 33 and 27 percent of the incidences or deaths of uh, victims in these studies. Attempting to rescue people without proper equipment resulted in 22 and 40 percent of the deaths Combine those are 55 and 67. So you might think initially, well, 45 and 33% of the time, people are not doing these uh, things and they're doing regular routine uh, manu you know, maneuvers and operations around the storage. But think about these two times here, repair or rescue, in the context of time. You might repair your machinery at the, at the storage for an hour in a 40 hour uh, work week, for, for instance. So the, if you think of the incidences per time, you can really appreciate how dangerous these uh, situations can be. Number eight is I like to remind people that all manures produce gas. All manures are organic material and in some form of microbial degradation. Whether it's solid or liquid, hot or cold outside, we have something happening in the, in the manure and gases are a byproduct of those processes. The five gases we often talk, refer to are hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, methane, lack of oxygen, carbon dioxide. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about these specific gases, but we should always be talking about these ones and others. There are a lot of other gases that can displace oxygen and cause dangerous situations. So these are not an all-exclusive list. Number seven on my list of things to talk about with producers and uh, and commercial haulers is that open air storages are indeed confined spaces. We need to think about these areas as confined spaces. When we look at the definition of confined space, we often say it's large enough to enter, has uh, limited access, limited exit, and the two top pictures here, the grain bin or the uh, pit access at a sow farm, are indeed really uh, recognized by most people as a confined space. But neither one of these places are designed for normal worker occupancy, which would be a confined space definition. And neither is the bottom photo. Once we cross a fence at this outdoor storage where we have blue sky and lots of wind, we are in a confined space. So Field and Beaver in their study pointed out that 16% of their victims uh, in that study were actually in places that were not confined spaces. So open air storages do need respect. And Mike showed you a couple photos of areas where danger was indeed located next to or within the fence of these type of storages. Number six, different gases behave differently. Some gases are odorless, colorless, and some are explosive. Important to realize and to, to talk to people about and get producers and, and callers to realize is that gases can stratify. Some sink. Mike will tell us, and, and I'll even show some of his data or some of his uh, findings, that hydrogen sulfide is heavy. 
it wants to sink. It will stratify and be in a low area. Some rise. This bottom photo is a photo of a swine finishing farm in 2006 in Pennsylvania where the building was empty, the fans were down to save uh, you know, energy costs, the producer was washing the barn and knocking back foam that was in his uh, underfloor swine manure storage pit. He was unknowingly to himself releasing methane and the methane went to the ceiling. This is a picture of the ceiling after it burned. The heater kicked on that day in the winter and a ball of fire went through the barn really high on the ceiling. Uh, he got third degree burns, but you can see the damage to the ceiling. And it actually was so explosive that it buckled the, uh, you know, the metal roof on this barn. So it was a pretty big issue. Luckily the barn did not burn down. Everything was repairable and he's still in operation. Number five on my list, and I will expand this one with a few more slides. Some characteristics that increase risk. Well, I've looked at a number of studies and done a literature review on this and come up with some conclusions on, on risk. And some of these are apparent to a lot of us, but we need to talk about these things to our audiences. Liquids trump solids. Liquids are more dangerous or and represent more risk than solid manures, but I like to use the visual uh, story, if you will, of putting a shovel or a front end loader into a solid manure stack. And most people can appreciate that in cool weather, they will see a, a release of steam from that solid manure. All manures re need respect, and that release of steam is a perfect visual of how gases can come off in a great uh, release, and as Mike said, a bloom. It is unclear to me or in literature that I've looked at whether swine liquid or dairy liquids represent a higher risk. So we do know that anaerobic situations are worse than aerobic situations. And certainly anaerobic situations occur very quickly in a liquid system. Anaerobic microbes are more likely to produce hydrogen sulfide and deep storages have a lot of time to create gases. Finally here on this bullet is the movement of manure greatly increases the release of gas. Agitation is an especially risky time, and it's important to consider this from solid manures as well. So here's a set of slides that I first uh, developed from a model by Ji Quinn Ni from Purdue, and kind of uh, migrated it into a simplified form to fit my audiences. Leslie is going to post slides that I am presenting. Uh, the slides that I have here, the slide I have here is just one slide, in the ones that I'm making available for everyone to utilize if you wish, there are a couple slides that help to explain this maybe a little easier for some audiences. But when we look at the photo on the picture on the left, this might represent a normal manure storage at six or eight, 10 feet deep. We're going to have a concentration gradient from high concentrations lower in a stratified system to lowest concentrations uh, in the free air stream. So as the uh, air moves across the manure storage, we will have very little gas in that. And let's use ammonia as an example. NH3 is something we're all familiar with fluxing off or releasing from manure when we take it to the field. So a lot of our audiences uh, appreciate and relate the release here in a flux situation from the storage with some things that they involve, uh, get involved with on the agronomic end. So I like to use uh, ammonia as an example. I don't have it listed here specifically, but in my other slides it is if you care to use those. The free air stream comes across very little uh, concentration, if any, in that free air stream. At the manure surface, we have some ammonia in the solution. Whenever uh, the molecules want to find an equilibrium, a gas molecule will flux off into the air and leave a hole, if you will, in the equilibrium of the concentration at the manure surface, and more ammonia will try to take that place as we get established equilibrium and move up. So that might make sense to a lot of people, and most producers can, can agree and, and, and understand that. But then we talk about agitation. What are we doing? We're taking that higher stratified concentration, and we're changing it to a uniform concentration throughout the storage. And we have two main effects here. Not only are we changing the surface concentration of ammonia or any other gas, but we're also increasing the effective surface area of the gas. So the so manure storage shows the same square footage, but we're increasing that effective surface area and the flux rate greatly increases. 
So a simple definition of flux is the action of flowing. Ammonia is, is an example that I like to use here and that relates a lot on the agronomic end as well to our producers. But ebullition is another action of loss of gas. Ebullition is defined as the action of bubbling or boiling. Some gases released through ebullition, hydrogen sulfide being uh, the most important one that we worry about. Methane and carbon dioxide also can flux, or not flux, say, <laughs> emit this way. Um, so what is happening with ebullition? Concept that I don't hear other people talking about that I try to bring in because most people can, can appreciate that they've seen manure storage is bubbling. So what's happening in storage? The, the microbes are producing gas that, uh, that in their metabolisms that is excreted or byproduct into the solution of the manure. The gases eventually become uh, thick enough or a concentration that's high enough that they exceed their individual gas solubility in that solution. We can find gas solubility for water, but manures are a completely different nature. Every manure might be a little different and have a different solubility for the given gas. These gases, once they exceed their solubility, will create a bubble, and that bubble can jump up to the surface. That may or may not create foam. My final bullet here is the, the soda can analogy. I often take two soda cans. I don't know if you can see this, but I take two soda cans uh, at a meeting, and I'll shake one up. And when I shake it up, it often just helps to wake up the crowd and get them interested. And then I take the cans, and I put them behind my back, and I kind of mix them up and clink them together so everyone knows that they don't know which one's which. And I hand one to somebody. And that person, I try to pick the big burly guy that is tough in the audience, and I put it down in front of them. And no one, I've done this dozens of times, no one has ever opened it. So why haven't they opened it? They all first appreciate that this would release gas, and it's the simplest example we can come up with of a release of gas and how it might relate to agitation. But these guys, big burly haulers and producers, are afraid of this 12-ounce can. So the next point is, well, producer, if you're afraid of 12 ounces of Pepsi, you really better be afraid of a million gallons of manure. And those kind of little lessons help to sink in and, and you know, make it a little more fun in the audience. Number four, warm weather greatly increases risk. Field and Beaver showed us that 60% of incidents occurred between May and August, with 26% or one out of four occurring in August. So what's happening here? Our storages are often emptied in the spring, and our land is now planted and growing and not available for manure application. So we have to hold on to it. We have to hold on to it for months. These are going to accumulate a mass of manure and a depth of manure that will be anaerobic. It's the warmest time of year, so our microbes are going to be very active. That anaerobic manure is also left undisturbed, so we can build up gases in the solution. But another point that uh, I don't necessarily have here, something to think about, is we have the whole chain of manure food available. When manure hits the storage, we'll have some pretty big molecules in there. And the microbes are going to use those molecules and break them down to smaller, and we're now smaller, smaller molecules. Some of our gas-producing microbes are actually at the bottom end of this uh, degradation chain. But some of our still manure in August has been in storage for four months, and some of it may be only four hours. Right? We have a continual supply in that, and we have the entire chain available, and we have all the microbes operating at the best they can all year and the food supply is continual, and that, that, con that ought to come into play, even though there's not a lot of science out there on it. Another point to bring up here, though, is 60% in warm weather, that means 40% occur in cold months. So between September and April, we have dangerous times that still exist, even though it's cold. I also like to remind people not to get complacent. Complacency is not good even in the wintertime, and that brings us to number three, which is complacency kills. I often tell the story in my audiences about the gerbils that we had at the mining household. My daughter had two gerbils in a fish aquarium, glass-sided aquarium with a screen top. One morning, we're all busy going to school and work, and the cat figured out how to kind of start lifting up that screen top. 
So what does this extension operator do, right? This person who talks about these things knows about this stuff. I put a poster board on top of that. And then I put some heavy books on top to keep the cat out. So I'm going to save the gerbils until we can come home and fix this. What do I do? I create a confined space. That one inch of well-kept gerbil bedding with a little gerbil uh, manure in it created enough gas to kill those gerbils and we had to have a funeral. Complacency kills. I should know better and I did something that wasn't very smart. I didn't think through it. It's not uncommon for us to hear uh, comments like they've gone in there to repair that item many times or he has agitated at that manure storage many times and we haven't had an issue. So those are the kind of things that we need to safeguard against. Our normal daily practices need to actually prevent risk if we can. So this is one time where the agricultural work ethic, which is unparalleled, where we all want to work until the job is done so we can feel good and then you know, move on to what's next. I tell people you can work yourself to death. This is one time where the agricultural work ethic can backfire. So complacency kills, then what can prevent that? Well, standard operating procedures and good habits can provide some level of protection. If we continue to do things in good manners and good habits, then we can uh, pre prevent ourselves from being in bad situations. So tips for operators. Always we recommend that we use a monitor. We want to observe agitation from a distance. Perhaps kill switches, like in this photo where we have a manure agitation boat, are a great thing. You can be 100 yards away and shut agitation down. This is something that we need to preach to our operators, our producers, our haulers, and also our equipment companies. Let's get more of this type of technology onto our equipment so that we can work in a safer environment. The first hour agit agitation, Mike will tell us, is the worst, but never let your guard down. Remember the health of nearby livestock as well. And Mike, uh, in his work, came up with his non-technical term of throw, right? Gases are thrown in the direction of manure agitation, and that makes sense. You think about the flux and the ebullition photos that we just looked at. So how do, how do uh, operators position themselves? Up and away is a good idea. Do not reach over the edge and do not work in low eye-lying areas where hydrogen sulfide can accumulate. Choose by all means an upwind position. If we are designing and constructing uh, storages, let's offer several options on the upwind side uh, as, as an option. No matter what day it is, we can get there, right? We can go to different gates or different places to, to access the manure storage and be upwind at all times. Mike provides us with this slide. If you look where the green arrows are going, the wind was coming across that manure storage during agitation, and they had to go up and over a heifer barn or through it. He saw in that area hydrogen sulfide levels that were deadly. I like to, let, I like to think of this and have people picture it, if they can, as a stream of water. And if you had a big rock in a, in a swift stream, behind that rock where an eddy is, you'd have sand that settled out. Most people in the audience say, yeah, I can envision that. Well, hydrogen sulfide can be the sand in the water. It can accumulate in that eddy and actually become dangerous. When the wind shifted and went to the east here, Mike's levels that he recorded uh, were not nearly as high or as dangerous. So we, can, we need to be aware of areas that trap gas. Point number two, winding things down here, are that we need to make choices for children. We can understand this. We can accept responsibility and educate kids, but also make choices for them. So what is our responsibility? Everyone has an obligation to design, supply, buy, operate, and maintain manure storage and handling systems that are safe for workers, visitors, and children. These three photos are all from the same day at the Manure Expo, where every time there's a hole or a pit, kids walked up to it. Field and Beaver showed us that 21% of fatalities were people under 16 years of age, and 11% of the people were listed as playing and discovered missing, and of course, those were all children. So barriers such as this should be part of our standard operating procedures. A bungee cord, locking systems when we leave, et cetera, to prevent access. My final point with a couple slides here is that 
another type of monitoring. In reality, our target audience is only going to have a low percentage of workers of visitors, visitors that wear monitors. I have a monitor and I don't usually use it. I it might be complacent there. So in an effort to plant seeds in people's mind, I've created a list of body alarms. It's not all inclusive. It contains symptoms of a number of gases, but I try to get people to think about the signs of gas exposure in their own head that might allow them to realize an alarm in their body or their brain to get them out. I ask them with this slide often, what will you do if your smoke alarm goes off while you sleep tonight? And everyone says, I'll get up and get out. So let's put an alarm instead of on our belt, let's put one in our head as well. We'd like to have both. We always want to preach a monitor, but we know that people don't always use them. These body alarms are here for you to review dizziness, wobbly knees, feeling hot and clammy, lack of attention to details, loss of motor skills, fatigue, anxiety or excitement, severe eye irritation, headaches, nausea, shortness of breath, panting, pausing, respiratory tract issues, tightness of chest, bronchitis, association and consciousness loss, which I've mentioned, I know people like that. If those alarms go off in your head today, tomorrow, or five years from now, let it be an alarm to you to get the fresh air. So I'll wrap things up, uh, reminding you that gas is produced from all manures. We have microbial deg degradation going on at all times. Open air storages need respect. Repair and rescue are dangerous times. Shaking the Pepsi can increases the release of gas. Complacency kills. If you wish, please use these body alarm ideas and pass it on to other people. It might really help others. And ventilation is so important. We need fresh air. 